Okay, welcome everyone. Uh, my name is Mace. I'm joined here with Eddie and Marley, and we will quickly go through a round world tour for what uh, 6CLI has been up to for the past couple of months. Uh, our intention is to answer as many questions as you might have, so if you already are thinking through the question, that will be the best option. We try to go through the slides rather quickly um, to be able to answer your questions. Uh, so 6CLI uh, is currently led by four, uh, four people. Eddie and myself are here. Unfortunately, Natasha and Katrina uh, could not be with us today. Uh, and what 6CLI basically does is we are responsible for uh, development and standardization of the broadly said CLI framework, so kubectl and all the libraries and tools that are uh, built to help you build your own uh, CLI tools, not only kubectl, but literally everything else, including plugins for kubectl. Uh, the sub-project that we own, as I mentioned, aside from kubectl, customize, uh, and crew, uh, there's also CUI, which is a graphical inter interface for, uh, for kubectl. Uh, there are libraries like CLI Runtime and CLI Experimental, which help you and also us to build the CLIs that are comfortable with uh, with kubectl and a couple additional sub projects, uh, you can find us on uh, on Kubernetes Slack under hash six CLI. We also have a mailing list. Both of these are rather low volume, so feel free to to jump and follow around and ask questions or uh, propose uh, topics. If you're a person that prefers direct communication, we also hold. Uh, bi-weekly meetings on Wednesdays, or alternatively uh, on the other Wednesdays, we are holding either customized or kubectl box prop, which is a goal, uh, also an amazing place to, to join. And if you're interested in working and picking up particular issues that we're going through, uh, it's also a nice place to, uh, to join us. Uh, okay, so we had a couple of releases since the last time. Um, Release 1.27 had some enhancements. We added default container annotations that are used by kubectl, as well as sub-resource support for kubectl. Uh, aggregated discovery helps like speed things up. Like if you pull an API server that has a ton of resources on it, it takes forever. Um, Open API v3 also came um, for the explain, and we got apply prune got redesigned. And we also have the kubectl create sub plugins. So uh, some of the highlights from 1.27 is debug. We added a couple of uh, new profiles for it. Um, didn't we have sysadmin also? Or is that that one's for the next one? Okay. Uh, general baseline and restricted, um, and there's some more coming later as well. And then um, we upgraded the package version of Customize that comes with kubectl to 5.0.1 and um, promoted the alpha um, who am I uh, up to um, auth, auth, yeah, so auth who am I. And um, finally, um, we had kubectl diff prune behavior corrected to actually use the selectors properly. And that was backported to other other versions so that they could make use of it as well. Uh, 128 had a couple of things come in. Uh, we had events, and then we had the interactive delete flag. So if you've ever accidentally deleted everything in your cluster before, um, you might want to start using the interactive delete flag so it will tell you, like, do you want to do this for real or not? <laughs> um, uh, yes, Brian added some cool stuff. So uh, port forward before would just take whatever pod, uh, which could sometimes re result in the terminating pod being picked. So now we look for one that's uh, actually running instead of a terminated one. And diff added the concurrency flag. And we also made wait a little bit easier to use um, by making the value at the end of the JSON path expansion uh, optional. And then, um, 1.29, wait, oh, new. oh, sorry, we promoted the interactive delete flag to beta in 1.29, and um, as well as the create sub plugins. And um, this was, yeah, there's been some improvements to the help messages, which has been really great. And um, 
we added support for simple filters for kubectl weight uh, to match field contents. Yeah, just a couple future things that we're thinking through. Uh, in progress right now, we're working on transitioning from Speedy to WebSockets. Uh, anyone know what Speedy is? Yeah, it was like this transitional protocol between like HTTP 1 and 2. Uh, and so Speedy has long been deprecated, but the Kubernetes API server completely depends on Speedy. So we're kind of pulling that out and hopefully transitioning that over to uh, a WebSocket approach. Uh, this is with shared partnership with the API machinery folks. Uh, another thing that we have in progress is separating out our cluster configuration from user preferences. You may have heard us talk about this for the past two years. I'm sorry, Marley is actually working on it now, so hopefully it gets done. Uh, but the idea is that you know when your cloud provider ships you your cube config, uh, you don't want to have to blow away or merge the one you have. You want your you know pr uh, preferences to kind of be separated. So that's the the goal there, where you can do things like opt into delete confirmation by default. Uh, so you don't have to remember to do the flag. So that's the thought behind that. Some things we're exploring, and we'd be happy to talk more about this during the Q&A part. Um, we have gone back and forth on the server-side apply thing for a while, and we arrived at the place that we can't switch to server-side apply by default without breaking people and everything. It just kind of changes behavior. But it's the behavior we want and we are intending to happen. So we may need to have a new command so we don't break everyone. Kubernetes project is just terrified of breaking your pipeline that's been running for 40 years and you're using kube control but updating it and not reading the release notes. So uh, that's something we're thinking about. We are looking at JSON path improvements so alternatives. Our JSON path that we use in kube control is not a real JSON path implementation. It's a library that does most JSON path syntax, but the, the functions and utilities like length and stuff that you're used to from other libraries don't exist. So a lot of people just come in and you're kind of limited there. Uh, I think cell is becoming very popular, the common expression language from Google. Uh, you might see cell popping up in a lot more places. It's much more uh, fluid and you can do a bit more with it. What's that? Yeah. Uh, and the other thing is, please no more flags. Uh, if you've ever seen the Cube Control help page, it's hundreds and hundreds of lines long. Uh, we say no to a lot of things, and we don't like to say no, but we say no because we have a reason as maintainers. And adding flags is just a pain point that we've had for years because uh, that help text keeps growing and flags are permanent where we can't like revoking a flag that exists breaks people. And so we, we just, we, we're trying to figure out ways to add features that people want without having to add another flag for it. So those are the things we're thinking through. Um, Uh, a couple of major themes from the sub projects that are also under our, our umbrella is uh, from Customize. Uh, we did mention that we pulled in uh, Customize uh, version 5 into kubectl, but that was also a big thing toward, uh, at the beginning of this year. Um, there's multiple additional en enhancements that have happened over the, uh, the past year that are listed on the slide. But the most important ones that we want to uh, shout out are to the new maintainers, Anna, and Yuko, uh, both of them are have joined in the spring the maintainers group, uh, the maintainer training cohort that Natasha is leading. And over the past couple of months, they grow in the ranks, they stepped up, and they were recently promoted to maintainers for the customized project, which is an awesome thing because we have more people interested in and and that are actually helping us with uh, with pushing customized forward. A uh, couple highlights from, from Crew. Uh, Crew is basically our plugin manager. There's a bunch of uh, new kubectl uh, plugins growing. The graph nicely shows how, how the numbers are growing uh, with every single day, basically. We've been giving this PSA also for years, and you're going to hear it again. I'm sorry. Uh, but there's a big difference between declarative and imperative workflows when you're using Kubernetes. Uh, the idea is that you're not supposed to mix these. You're not supposed to mix your imperative with your declarative. We want you all to stay with the declarative world. Uh, you may be asking what these are. Imperative commands that you may be familiar with. Anyone use any on this list on the daily? Don't be shy. I know there's a couple of you. We want to hear what these commands are and why you need them and why you can't use things like apply and other stuff. So ask us questions. Talk to us about that. 
but we're trying to move away from these commands. They kind of just break the whole world. The only command you really should be using is apply, whether you're doing this with GitOps or other bits. Uh, you should be hopefully using some kind of GitOps pipeline to apply your pipelines. But yeah, rollout undo kind of screws everything up. And, and the reason behind this is that there's a annotation that gets added to your manifest called the last applied annotation. And when cube control apply is doing a diff and figuring out how to transition from one state to the next, if you make a change outside of that last applied annotation, it's not tracked. So it actually doesn't know what it transitioning from and to. Uh, so it kind of just screws up all the things and uh, we tried to handle fixing it for years and now we're just saying stop doing it. So use apply please. Uh, that's, oh, uh, I don't know if anyone saw the keynote this morning, not to throw anyone under the bus, but they violated this. So that's why we added this back in to keep talking about. So please use apply, uh, don't use create. Uh, and then there's lots of docs on this. So TLDR, please use apply. Uh, and that's all we have prepared. We'd love to have conversation, discuss, answer questions. Uh, make sure you fill out the code, uh, give us good reviews so they let us keep doing this as maintainers. Uh, and yeah, who would like to start with questions or discussion? We got a mic, so in the, right there in the middle, yeah. So please don't be shy. Tell us what's, what's painful to you, tell us what you want to change, fix, uh, this is very useful for us as maintainers because we don't get to act with the broader community very often. So I'm going to start calling on people if you don't, if someone doesn't volunteer. Come on. Yes, we got a mic here, if you could. Thank you. Uh, hi, I'm a huge fan of both Customize as well as KPT. Another pro Hey, someone knows what I'm talking about. Nobody ever does. Um, and really interesting, both those projects use KRM functions, um, which I'm actually a huge fan of. But I did notice there doesn't seem to be too much activity around there. I just wonder if we get a status update on um, if those are going to be prioritized or deprecated or that kind of thing. Uh, yeah, I was talking with Natasha. Natasha is currently uh, the primary and sole maintainer behind Customize. Uh, there has been discussions around the KRM, KRM and in general Customize. The, the primary focus within Customize currently was on that um, uh, training cohort uh, because Natasha was uh, facing a situation where she was the only one and wanted to primarily focus on getting more contributors. She put together a roadmap where this is like the highest priority for the next six months more or less after we're done with that um she put together a couple additional topics i think i remember there was a uh, a mention of krm and i would probably just say that uh checking out the roadmap that is uh that was recently added to the customized repository so kubernetes 6 slash customize there's a roadmap file that was updated like a week ago roughly she was talking about it during our um, last Wednesday's call. Uh, I think I remember seeing uh, KRM functions, so that's probably that. Or additionally, um, asking on the customized Slack channel about the, the future of KRM. Um, especially if you're interested in seeing this moving in a one or the other direction and giving that kind of feedback to uh, Natasha and the folks will be definitely very helpful because it will, it will provide her to make the final decision uh, being able to say how many people actually use it, whether that's something that we want to slowly phase out or we actually should invest because A, there is a growing interest and B, there are people who are also capable of supporting her with the work that is required for KRM. Yeah, there was a lot of traction at one point. Um, I think it was a collaboration between Google, Apple, and uh, there was a third one. Do you remember who? Um, there, was a, there was a bunch of interest, and then everything got re-prioritized. We had the wave of tech layoffs come. Uh, the person who was leading the project got slashed down. Uh, so, yeah, it's one of those things where if we have people interested who want to push it forward, we'd love to have that for sure. Also, tell your companies to hire maintainers. Thank you. Yes. <laughs> Thank you all. Hi. Uh, I work with a team that is constantly getting new people onboarded into Kubernetes. Um, I know kubectl has a few instances where, um, say your kubeconfig is world readable, it'll warn you, hey, this isn't safe. What are your thoughts on um, uh, 
using a similar um, approach for imperative versus declarative uh, application. Just so I can, when I have new people come on board, they can understand that, hey, this is, you can do it this way, but it's not necessarily best practice. The, that's a great question. Uh, the, we've, we've messed around with warnings a lot in like different forms. And what we've realized is that people get really annoyed when you keep warning them on things. So we've tried to do at times where like, we like maybe warn you once and then set like a flag somewhere in a cache file that's like, oh, don't warn them again. Um, we would love to warn all the time. Uh, would your engineers, do you think they'd be annoyed if every time they used a imperative command, if it popped up with the little thing? I'm okay with them being annoyed. <laughs> <laughs> I, th there is also the topic that we mentioned, the uh, uh, queue preferences. That's one of the solutions that we're still waiting to. There's a lot of things that we would like to add, uh, but the fact that we cannot turn them on, on and off by default, or have a little bit of, allow users to have a little bit more flexibility around interacting with kubectl, stops us from and prevents us from uh, picking up those additional things until we have those uh, the, those basic building blocks, because with that, that will actually open up uh, multiple different venues. There was a PR that, that Marley brought to my attention earlier today, where someone was introducing colors yet again, uh, and I was like, no, we're, we're not going to do colors until we have preferences, especially that the implementation, uh, the proposed implementation was very manual, going through all the files, adding colors everywhere. That's not the correct approach. That's not what we want to maintain in the long run, and especially that this was this was done not the first time. We want to prefer we would prefer having some global solution that would be more maintainable, and most importantly, would be easy to turn on and off depending on whatever users' needs are. There's also a, a different topic which we've been playing with a couple of times, but we need people who are interested in helping with that. Is either some kind of documentation or a tutorial for users that are especially newcomers to the system, how to help them with grasping the ideas behind Kubernetes. Because a lot of time you are faced with, oh, um, okay, cube color run and it will create a pod. That's fine, but I want to have some more um, sophisticated tooling or a little bit how to quickly get from oh, I know how to run a pod to, oh, I know how to get around because there are deployments, there are those additional things. We do miss and we are fully aware that we miss some kind of like a walkthrough, like a teaching guide, something that we either would be a plugin or we would be even willing to put into the cube where maybe some kind of like a wizard that would step you through, oh, like this is how you create your first pod, this is how you create your first, uh, first um, deployment and so forth. But then again, we would again have to have an ability to configure this and we go back to the point where we need to have those preferences file to be able to, uh, to figure out what your level is and turn it on or off because the moment we would introduce something like that, we get like thousands of PRs and complaints <laughs> with folks that just turn it off, turn it off, turn it off, turn it off. Yeah, like yeah. How, many th how many CI systems just run kubectl and then scrape the output to the command line. like, And they upgrade the version of kubectl without looking at the, the, the nodes. One of the interesting things that I just pulled up is this is actually the, the go type for what the cube config actually is. Uh, this has no versioning. It is a V1 uh, and it's kind of been solidified forever. And it's not actually a proper type inside of Kubernetes. Like you can't explain this. You can't find any API documentation on this. It does have a preference field. And the only preference that exists in that is colors. Uh, <laughs> which it, it has existed, but because this, this type it does in a real type and it's not versioned, we can't just add preferences to this. It also breaks backwards compatibility with everyone else's cube. It's been a hot mess. Um, so yeah, hopefully the cube RC type work that we've been doing lets us do that. But uh, I'm with you. I'd love to just piss everyone off until they opt out of warnings. But thank you. Thanks. <laughs> Hi, my name is Rohan, and um, I was wondering if there are currently any efforts to give kubectl copy more functionality like the way rsync has, because we have a use case where we're continually copying code over to a pod, and the way we do it right now is we 
we can't overwrite, so then we have to delete the code on the pod and then um, kubectl copy the code over. And so, um, you know, and then the other way to do it would be to actually use rsync by setting up an SSH jump pod, which we don't necessarily want to do. And so I was wondering for kubectl copy if there's going to be any efforts to bring it closer to rsync. Yeah, no, let me do that. I got this one. I got this. One. This is a great question. The Th there's so much history with cube control copy. There's been like, what, three CVEs? There's been a couple yeah. CVEs behind it. And it's just the, the reality of like how Linux file systems work. So it used to be a lot more feature rich and we pulled things out that every time a CVE, so now it is as dumb and simple as possible. We have been talking about ways to do this. We've actually been talking with uh, uh, Signode and the, the CRI team uh, we'd love to move all this functionality into the container runtime. So copying files and moving files should be a proper control of runtime, uh, container runtime API. And then it, it wouldn't be, you have to have a tar binary in your, your container to actually use this in the first place. So, you have anything to add? Yeah, basically. Uh, we need I someone to work on that. <laughs> We need the people down first to finish. Yeah, I was the person that was pulled in into all of the CVEs, uh, and we made a very tough choice. There was a, at some point in time when we were solving all those CVEs, and they literally piled one on the another over a span of uh, six months, maybe a little bit longer, where I spent multiple nights trying to figure it out. Um, that's how we slowly rolled down several additional options from copy. There was a point in time shortly afterwards that we were actually considering dropping the copy entirely because we were, we were afraid of additional problems. That's when we figure out that it's better to have a simple uh, version of copy still but allow people to eventually bypass that by using kubectl exec because theoretically what you can do these days is use kubectl exec and pipe a tar on both uh, ends of the stream and this way uh, transfer multiple files. Um, a, a little plaque from the OpenShift side of things. Uh, OpenShift has its own uh, OC client that is built on top of a cube cuddle. Uh, there exists a rsync command with an OC, which basically opens the stream for you and does like an rsync. Uh, we might eventually, at some point in time, consider bringing something like that into cube cuddle, but up until now, there hasn't been any particular requests. And also, if, rem if I remember correctly, the rsync functionality relies on what is actually the rsync binary has to be in the container, which is yet another um, additional requirement that we would have to put. Uh, we've decided to do it on the OpenShift side of things. I, I wasn't convinced that we want to do it in, in kubectl yet. Okay, so given the current nature of how kubectl copy works, then would you agree that using you know, rsync with an SSH jump pod would be the best way to go? Probably so, yeah. Got it. At least that's one of the options. Right. Thank you. Thank you. Hello. Uh, I have a question about uh, multi-cluster. Do you have any plan to support that multi-cluster through the kubectl? For instance, uh, let's say, I mean, uh, like uh, we are using multi-cluster to deploy the uh, app spread to the world. For instance, EU REST 1 and EU REST 4 in GCP and we want to risk it up uh, no matter where it is. So I want to know, do you have any plan or if you don't have any, do you have any like a, like a recommended or prepared way to risk it up or check that group cutters? So there are two different things that we have to look at uh, when looking at multi-cluster. The support for multi-clusters in kubectl these days is not great. I'm fully aware because you basically end up jumping between various contexts. I've been talking with our internal SRE teams uh, who, who are challenge, uh, who challenge me how we could try to improve the situation when dealing with regular commands in a multi-cluster environment. 
so this is a real problem that we are noticing, especially when uh, as people are um, are having more and more cluster that are, they are working with on a daily basis. Um, the other side of the thing is the actual multi-cluster coming from SIG multi-cluster, because I haven't seen anyone within this multi-cluster SIG coming up with any particular needs for having additional commands to support their use cases. So there are two ends that we would have to look at. Uh, if there is particular functionality that you would want to see in the multi-cluster realm, that would be probably a question for SIG multi-cluster. I, I don't recall uh, them coming over to us with they want to extend kubectl with some additionals. And then there's the question of how we can make kubectl natively be better when, discuss, when talking to multiple clusters. The preference file is one of the possibilities, uh, but I wouldn't want to restrict us with uh, solving that with just the preferences. That's actually something that I would like to do separately. Yeah, I was talking with somebody about that earlier today, using the um, QRC to manage it, but it's putting a lot in one place, I feel like. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, I mean, for instance, uh, we, like our developer wants to see like the, how many parts across the cluster or between the multi-cluster. So we made a simple dashboard for it, for like, uh, for instance, like, uh, like fetching all of the data from each clusters and showing it out through the web GUI or some CRI. So I, that's why I was curious if you have any like plans, but yeah, I think it makes sense to ask the, the multi-cluster group because probably they will deal with this topic pretty soon or I hope so. So I will talk with them. Thank you. Yeah. And that, in that realm, that's definitely the best thing to, to talk about having some kind of like high level commands where you can, with a single command, get a high level overview of all of the clusters within given range. Yeah, thank you. By the way, the kubectl is kubectl or kubectl? Because I, most of the time I, I call it uh, kubectl, but... It's actually kubectl. Kubectl. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> we, uh, That's our official answer, yes. Kubectl. <laughs> <laughs> it, it depends. Uh, I personally <laughs> use both interchangeably. I, um, if we want to, uh, I don't know, disrupt someone, we will play with those names a little <laughs> bit more. But uh, uh, if you follow the logo, it's Cubicuddle. It is a cuttlefish, yeah. the, the yeah. logo. I don't know if I'll pull it up for people. Okay, good. I, I, I can no, convince my colleague it. to call it as yeah, Cubicuddle. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, yeah, and then the, the use case that you described, those are the things that we need to hear. Yeah. So like how you wanna use it, like what's missing, um, file an issue, a feature request, or send an email to the mailing list. Like those are the things that we, bec I don't think any of us really work with multi-cluster that often either. So we have no idea what we would need to have a good experience there. So I barely work with yeah. one cluster. There you go, that's the logo. <laughs> So you asked earlier about why people might still use Cubectl create instead of Cubectl apply. Um, <laughs> and uh, the, the one thing that uh, some folks might, and I, I totally agree, is like um, templating YAML to then apply to the cluster. It is by far the best way to get working up-to-date current spec YAML. It's better than going to the API spec because, oh my God, and then the docs because sometimes they're great, sometimes they're not. Depends on the API you're working with. So just if you don't want to have create anymore, I'm cool with that, but then we need like Quebec uh, template or something like that. Cause it, it, it's a huge thing for learners, for new yeah. people and even experienced people. Hell they have you do it on the CKA exam. So. It's actually a, a topic that uh, came up multiple times. The explain is one thing, but it doesn't solve the, so the problem because it provides with descriptions. I would like to see a combination uh, of the output that is coming from Cube, uh, from kubectl explain with um, some kind of a templating mechanism or something that will provide me with a simplest version of the resource that I can start with, with the explanations, 
And then once I start it, I I'm at least know. But that goes back to one of the previous questions where we were talking about the wizards um, and those topics around how we can help people uh, get started. There was an, actually an interesting uh, tweet earlier today from one of the Cube core maintainers where he was alluding that we are solving cube or cube UIs in the wrong way because we are focusing a lot on uh, on expressing or forcing users to know what they want. Whereas, for example, if you're looking at a regular file manager, that one gives you every file. It doesn't tell you to choose, oh, I want to see just images or just videos. It will give you everything by default and only afterwards. It allows you to, uh, to filter by type. Uh, I was thinking how we could do something similar in kubectl, for example. Maybe not necessarily because I'm fully aware that this kind of um, command might be heavy on the API server if we start uh, trying to pull everything. But having some kind of helper or a starter page that, such that you are um, guided, at least initially, because once you figure it out, a lot of folks after uh, a couple of first hours, they will know that, oh yeah, I wanna see this and that's all. And they will be reaching only for the specifics. But the initial steps when you're learning, when you're a newcomer, maybe even for exam, or just want to look around what's in the cluster, you would love, to, I would personally love to see like a tree representation which will show me that, oh, there's a deployment. And actually that deployment actually rolls down to this particular replica set which rolls down to those pods underneath in a, some kind it's of a like tree structure. by the service. Yeah. yeah. I, I wonder if there was, I need to look it up. I, I did not get a time. Uh, I think there is a kubectl tree plugin. I don't recall how it's working and maybe something like that and having something like that by default would be an option, one of the possibilities that we would apply. I'm, I'm going through a couple of different options, uh, uh, at least this week so far, trying to think about this. But yeah, this, this is a real problem because for newcomers, it's hard. I'm, I'm fully aware and with every single release, it's actually not getting easier, but it is getting harder because there's more and more stuff that are being added. We've experimented with a cube control gen generate command and plugin, uh, and like we can do stuff like hook into the open API and add a, the open API has an examples field built into it. And so then we could go to the core types or CRD authors could add example fields. The problem with that, it's, it's a very, that's a, very big task. It's a very big project working across lots of different parts of the project. Uh, and we'd l I'd love to see it for sure. So let's, we gonna need people to sponsor that work or come to do it. Thank you. Great, great idea. Hi there. My name is Brandon. Uh, plus one on the kubectl template idea or generate that, that would be awesome. Um, yeah, main thing is uh, sad to hear that it sounds like there's one maintainer on customize. That's explains a lot about the project. I'll have to check the roadmap and see how that's going and how I might be able to help. Um, but on that and the KRM functions versus the built-ins, uh, my whole GitOps <laughs> workflow relies very heavily on the Helm generator. <laughs> um, so I would like some kind of decision one way or the other about what is happening with the Helm generator plugin because the limbo that it's in right now is giving me a lot of stress. Uh, mainly that it doesn't support private registries, so we have an artifactory that we push all of our private Helm charts to, and I'd like to use that as a source <laughs> for the Helm generator in order to work around that. I have to write a bunch of janky scripts to authenticate and pull them to a known location and uh, <laughs> do some things to work around it. Um, so anything that would actually be in the tool would be great. And of course, you know, I'd be happy to collaborate on it once I know what direction the project's going in and where to contribute. So yeah. That, I don't know if that's a question or a statement or what, but do, do with we, it what you will. We will, <laughs> we will make sure to pass that information over to Natasha. Okay, awesome. Thank you, it's, it's super insightful and yeah, it's, we just, 
we need people to show up and help out. So I love the offer for sure. Join us on Slack. Yeah. Join the, the mailing list meetings. I, I am an enthusiast. I have my own org, Customize Everything, where <laughs> I have some crappy GitHub actions that I use to do rendered YAML manifests and promotions. So uh, yeah. yeah, Cargo is going to replace that, I hope. But, but um, heard. We need a clear, <laughs> a clear either this or that or, yeah. Yep. Just choose something, and I will, I will be there. <laughs> anyway, thank you. Thank you. We have. We're over. No, 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 yeah, we're over. We do the last one, hopefully. They don't kick us off the stage. Yeah, I think mine will be quick. Um, I manage a platform engineering team at a pretty small end user organization. We have about 100 developers. And I'm pretty ignorant of the inner workings of the CLI, but the talk around kube preferences is something I'm really interested in. And in, in the nature of like setting up guardrails and being able to opt into warnings or things like that. And I'm curious if you have thought about use cases where like an organization or a team wants to have like a shared preferences file, like I want my team to have warnings opted into or have certain behaviors enabled, and maybe they override it, maybe I don't want them to. Is that something that's, that's being discussed at all? Uh, I have not thought about that. I will think about that more. Um, I, it'll probably be after I actually get the thing to work to begin with, with local files. <laughs> um, but I think that's, that's an interesting idea. Um, but for, for now, it'll just probably, for, for 1.0, it'll just probably end up having to be like, you have to distribute the file. Like, I don't know if you're like imaging laptops for your developers or if they set their own, their own up or anything yeah, like that. Yeah, we've got a bootstrap script that, that I mean, starts with the uh, login and good. generates it. But yeah. A lot will depend on how you are providing the machines for your users. Because if, assuming you would be providing them with uh, machines that they don't have access to the top level, uh, directories, uh, we could, for example, implement it in a way that the regular um, Unix system works, where you have etcd directories within which you have top level and system wide uh, user preferences that the user cannot modify because they are system wide. And then each user has the ability to, um, to customize their own uh, sets within their own local directory. So providing that levels, we could potentially address the use case that you might have. But I think, like like Martin mentioned, we need the the first thing, and then we can probably extend with the additional steps. Yeah. But yeah, thank that's you. that's very valuable feedback. Thank you very much. Yeah, thank you a lot. Yeah, it's. So, I think it's kept thirty one oh four. If that you, is it. what is it? Yeah, three one oh four. Three one oh four. If you want to find the issue and drop ideas, thoughts, feature requests. Caps are stored in a Kubernetes slash enhancements uh, repo. Cool. Thank you all for Thank you. joining.